Save a fish, save the planet. It has a nice ring, don't you think? Admittedly, most of us don't tend to look at fish as the heroes of a great global drama. Most of us like to see them boiled, baked, grilled, or fried. But that still forces us to ask the question, with fish numbers plummeting, how can we ensure a sustainable harvest that's good for them and good for us? A growing global movement is trying to rebuild wild stocks and give fish a break by setting aside patches of ocean as no fishing zones. In Baja, California, strict new regulations on the size, sex, and timing of lobsters caught is making for a better harvest. And similar measures are helping North Pacific halibut and Bristol Bay sockeye salmon. There are a lot of solutions on the table. One that many think will be the most vital is fish farming. Aquaculture already produces nearly half the fish we eat. It's been called the blue revolution. But critics argue that the gains aren't worth the costs. But before throwing out the fish with the aquaculture water, it's worth asking this, is there a better way to do it? Don't let the idle boats fool you. Fish are big business here. This is the home of Cook Aquaculture. It may be the face of modern fish farming. Near shore operations like this one produce most of the farm seafood for the world. Like most farms, Cook is intensely focused on a single product. Here it's salmon, 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 salmon. It's all about the salmon, or it was, until these two guys came along. Thierry Chopin is a marine biologist. Sean Robinson is an ecologist. In 2001, they approached executives with a novel idea. What if they could add to their product line while also making their farm less taxing to the environment. Their recipe for success was simple. Grow additional foods right alongside the salmon, kelp and mussels. Their pitch, it would be good both for the bottom line and the surrounding habitats. But executives don't usually like to rock the boat. And they kind of looked at us and said, well, why would we want mussels on the site? Why would we want to have more kelp? We want less kelp and less mussels. To fish farmers, kelp and mussels seem like unwelcome guests. They clog nets and reduce water circulation, which can raise the chance of disease. Kelp and mussels also complicate maintenance. But where farmers saw a mess, Chopin and Robinson saw opportunity. They believed that kelp and mussels could serve as living filters, thriving on the cloudy waste generated in the salmon pens. They argued that the two new species would solve a big problem for the fish farmers. Raising fish, like raising pigs and chickens, can be a dirty business. An average salmon farm produces the waste of 60,000 people. This pollution can degrade habitats. Beyond clearing the water, kelp and mussels offer another advantage. You can sell them. Eventually, executives started to nibble. But now they wanted to know what the plan meant for the thing they're paid to worry about the bottom line. The answer we got from the salmon industry was, well, it would have to be in the tens of thousands of dollars before they would be interested in this. One, two, three, four. When Robinson and Chopin crunched the numbers, they discovered more than pocket change. Kelp and mussels could improve the bottom line 
by $100,000 per year. By taking the ecological principle to them in an economic way, that sort of set the stage for, well, okay, we might be interested. It's not a new idea. Chinese, Japanese, Koreans have been doing integrated aquaculture for a few centuries. It's balancing your ecosystem, understanding the function of the organisms, and uh, taking it from there. Through rigorous measurements, Chopin and Robinson built their case. They showed that both kelp and the mussels grow faster near salmon pens, and that they have potential to absorb 40% of the waste from the water. The predicted economic benefits are starting to materialize. Look at this. Wow. There we go. Look at that. Here's what we needed. So that's Cook nice. Aquaculture is now selling kelp to Asian markets and mussels to local high-end restaurants as a seasonal delicacy. Cool. Look at these ones. Galvanized by success, Chopin imagines adding more animals to the menu, which could also help improve environmental quality. What we are doing at the present time is relatively simple with salmon, mussels, and seaweed, but we know that we will have to make it a little more complicated with sea cucumbers, sea urchins, uh, worms, and all these things. But really, it's nothing more than recreating a, a balanced ecosystem. In Canada, Chopin and Robinson are demonstrating that it's possible to make aquaculture more sustainable by keeping the whole ecosystem in mind. And their ideas are catching on throughout the industry. The future of fish farming depends on similar innovation. And one of the most dramatic cases is unfolding a little further downstream. To Brian O'Hanlon, responsible aquaculture is going to require many different approaches many different roads. O'Hanlon sees one future. And it's called the aquapod. This space-age sphere will enable O'Hanlon to boldly go where few have gone before, to farm the open ocean. O'Hanlon believes open ocean farming will dramatically increase production to meet rising demand. And it could do so with less harm to the environment than coastal farming for one simple reason. We have very strong, consistent, steady currents we never see the same water twice based on our current patterns. And the currents are so strong that it basically flushes the site. It translates into approximately 680 million gallons of water a day flowing through each cage. That basically provides a healthier growing environment for the fish, reduces stresses on the fish, but it also reduces the environmental impact directly around the farm. Strong currents could also help mitigate another problem sea lice. Near shore, sea lice can not only devastate farmed animals, they can also spread into surrounding waters to harm wild stocks. In the open ocean, currents sweep away sea lice eggs and larvae and reduce the chances of outbreak. One of the biggest problems faced by farmers like O'Hanlon is feeding his fish. O'Hanlon is raising cobia, they're carnivores. Flesh eaters are raised on wild-caught fish, often ground up and formed into pellets. So this kind of aquaculture is, ironically, increasing pressure on wild stocks. Some farmers dodge this problem by raising plant eaters, like catfish, tilapia, and carp, which can make for a more sustainable operation. But farmers like O'Hanlon are going a different route, coming up with creative alternatives. We've taken the issue around fish meal very seriously here. Right now, a significant portion of our protein is substituted with other 
sustainable farm-raised plant proteins. Today, aquaculture isn't perfect. Many problems remain to be solved. Shrimp farms have led to widespread destruction of mangroves. Lethal viruses can spread to the wild. Penned fish can escape and breed with wild animals. But as long as farmers like O'Hanlon continue to recognize and confront problems, the industry can evolve and improve. And as O'Hanlon sees it, a lot rides on efforts like his. What happens if aquaculture does not develop? We end up starving people all over the world. I think it's absolutely critical that aquaculture develops and that it develops sustainably. I fully believe in what we're doing and there's nothing else I want to do with my life than, than this and, and develop this industry. It used to be that nearly everyone with a rod and reel had a story about the big one that got away. Today, fishers are telling another kind of tale. A bounty thought to be inexhaustible turns out to be vulnerable. As life in the ocean is depleted, the effort it takes to catch any fish is going nowhere but up. And the decline of stocks has revealed the once invisible ties that bind all life to the sea. Can we ignore these connections? When we protect fish, we protect our home and ourselves. So let's make sure that the big one that got away isn't the entire planet.